A new topic area is psychological assessment, which essentially refers to the design and evaluation of psychological tests. So we're going to begin with a personality test. I'm going to administer it to you. Basically, I'm going to read a series of statements, and I would like for you to jot down true or false about yourself. All right, number one, you have a great need for other people to like and admire you. True or false, is this true of you? You have a great need for other people to like and admire you. Two, you have a tendency to be critical of yourself. You have a tendency to be critical of yourself. Three, while you have some personality weaknesses, you're generally able to compensate for them. While you have some personality weaknesses, you're generally able to compensate for them. Four, your sexual adjustment has presented problems for you. Your sexual adjustment has presented problems for you. Five, disciplined and self-controlled outside, you tend to be worrisome and insecure inside. Disciplined and self-controlled outside, you tend to be worrisome and insecure inside. Six, at times you have serious doubts as to whether you have made the right decision, <coughs> excuse me, or done the right thing. At times you have serious doubts as to whether you have made the right decision or done the right thing. Seven, you prefer a certain amount of change and variety and become dissatisfied when hemmed in by restrictions and limitations. That's under normal circumstances. You prefer a certain amount of change and variety and become dissatisfied when hemmed in by restrictions and limitations. Last, at times you're extroverted, affable, sociable, while at other times you're introverted, wary, and reserved. At times you're extroverted, affable, sociable, while at other times you're introverted, wary, and reserved. All right, this is an example of a poorly designed psychological test, and it illustrates what we call the Barnum effect. Most people, for most of these questions, are going to answer true. Uh, you have a tendency to be critical of yourself. You may have some personality weaknesses, but you're generally able to compensate. At times, you have doubts about whether you made the right decision. Um, you prefer a certain amount of change and variety and become dissatisfied when hemmed in by restrictions and limitations. Is anyone actually happy when they're hemmed in by restrictions and limitations? So this is a poorly designed psychological test because it does not distinguish between individuals. Instead, most of us tend to answer true to most of these questions. And this is named the Barnum Effect after P.T. Barnum. You've probably heard of him. He's name is related to the circus, of course, but he was an individual during the 1800s who made his fortune by just knowing about how people behave. You can read books about him, but my favorite anecdote about P.T. Barnum was that he was running a, a series of exhibitions and, you know, the public would go and pay at the door to go through the building and look at all the different exhibits, you know, like the Fiji mermaid or a woman with a beard. It, you know, typical exhibits of that time. And he had problems because people were coming in and they were staying too long at the exhibits instead of moving on out of the building so that new people could pay and come in. So what he did was put up a sign that said this way to the egress. Of course, he knew that most people didn't know what an egress was. Basically, it's a Latin term for an exit. So people would go happily off to look at the egress and out of the building they would go. So Barnum was someone who knew people quite well. And so this concept has come to be known as the Barnum effect. So that was an example of a poorly designed, a bad psychological test. Let's talk about the characteristics of good psychological tests. According to many psychologists, a good psychological test is objective, it's reliable, it's valid, and it's standardized with the representative population. So let's take that first characteristic of a so-called good personality test or good psychological test. Objective. What do we mean by that? We mean that the test is not subjective, but providing a definition that merely states the opposite is not informative. 
So what we mean when we say a psychological test is objective is that there are specific procedures for administering the test, for scoring the test, and for interpreting the results of the test. So I want you to think about testing in this course. We use multiple choice. Do you think that multiple choice testing is more or less objective than essay tests? And I would suggest, in fact, that multiple choice testing is more objective than essay testing. Now, when I give students an essay test, I try to make it as objective as possible, planning ahead how it's going to be scored and what specific information I want students to provide in the test. You try to make it objective, but a multiple choice test is inherently more objective than essay. And again, with our multiple choice tests, there are specific procedures for administering the test. <laughs> Back when we could go into the classroom, you would take the quizzes there and the TAs would follow specific procedures for administering the test. And there are specific procedures for scoring the test. Basically, you get one point for every question you get correct on a quiz. A second characteristic of a so-called good psychological test is that it's reliable. And what this means is that it yields consistent results, and it doesn't matter who administers it, where they administer it, and when they administer it. There are still reliable scores for individuals. So how do you know if a test is reliable? You can administer it twice, compare the scores, or you could use the split test method, which is probably better. By using a split test method to be able to assess reliability of a psychological test, you only have to administer the test once. And you're basically splitting it in half. And for half the answers, the score is compared to the score for the remaining half of the test. Now, I want you to think about this. Some psychological tests have hundreds of questions. And so is it a good idea to compare the beginning items on a test to the end items on a test? And the answer is no, that's not a good idea. You want to randomly select items, half the items of a test, and compare the score for those to the score for the remaining items on the test. And that way you can avoid fatigue effects. A third characteristic of a so-called good psychological test is that it's valid. And by this, I mean that the test measures what it's supposed to measure. If it's measuring sociability, then that's what it's measuring, and it's doing so fully. If it's measuring whether or not someone would be a good firefighter, then that's what it's measuring, and it's doing so in a valid fashion. So how do you know if a psychological test is valid? Maybe I decide that I want to put together a brand new test, paper and pencil test, of sociability see how sociable people are. So I design my test and I administer it to a group of people and I see what their scores are. And what I could do is I could, presuming I could leave my house at the moment, I could follow people around with their permission and, you know, record how many times they talk to other people. If we're on campus, I could, with permission, follow people around, see how many times you talk to people when you're walking across the quad, or how many parties you go to, or you know, do you speak to people in class before and after class? And I would expect uh, that the scores on the two types of assessment, behavioral and paper and pencil test, would be comparable if in fact my test is valid. Or I could put together a paper and pencil test that I could administer to people to see if they would be good firefighters. But then I would have to wait until they have the job and assess their behavior in that position and see if, if in fact the scores are comparable for the two ways of testing. And in that way I could determine whether or not my paper and pencil test is valid, measuring what it's supposed to measure. Now here's something important. I want you to think about it. A valid test is necessarily reliable, while a reliable test may not be valid. Um, if you think about it, a test that's measuring what it's supposed to measure is going to do so reliably. It's going to do so consistently. Scores on that test are going to be similar across time or within the same test. 
On the other hand, a test may be reliable and yield consistent results, but it may not be measuring what it's supposed to measure. It may not be valid. For instance, I know I upset people with these comments, but horoscopes, fortune telling, those types of assessments are not valid. For instance, with horoscopes, I think most scientists agree that there's no way that the movement of the planets affects anybody's behavior here on this planet Earth. Uh, it's not scientifically based, even though they're fun sometimes to do. Um, so, but you can have reliable results when you are someone who puts together horoscopes. Here's a little anecdote about my childhood, same sister that was teaching me things wrong all the time. When she was a teenager, she was very much into horoscopes and my mother bought her a book and she went into her bedroom for days and took everybody in the family, took their birth moment and proceeded to write up their, their horoscopes for them. What she did were a series of um, fairly convoluted calculations uh, regarding the movement of the planets and the exact time somebody was born. But she followed kind of a cookbook formula to do this. And I would suggest that anybody else using the same book, the same instructions, the same calculations would come up with a very similar horoscope to what she did. And so there kept the reliability there. But, hello, uh, probably not scientifically valid. Here's a, a simple illustration of what I'm saying, that a valid test is necessarily reliable, but a reliable test may not be valid. I drew a line on the screen there, and I'm asking how long is this line? Now if we were in the classroom, you could imagine that I would invite everybody up to the front of the room and hand you a ruler, and everybody in the room would measure this line using my ruler. And suppose everybody in the room determined that this line is two miles long. Now, in the classroom, even with a bigger screen, it's not going to be two miles long. But because I give you a bad test, a bad ruler, where the marks are all incorrect, everybody in the room came up with exactly the same measurement. And yet it's not a valid measurement. So yeah, a valid test is necessarily reliable for the most part, but a reliable test may not be valid. So let's test you. Standardization of a psychological test allows you to 1. Modify the results to reduce the reliability 3. Interpret the scores 4. None of the above and you should know that the answer is 3. Interpret the scores. So let's talk a little bit more about the procedure of standardization. And here I want to do it in the context of intelligence testing. We'll be talking about intelligence tests a little bit more later but right now, most modern intelligence tests are standardized using this normal curve. What I really want you to know is that the mean of modern intelligence tests, for the most part, is 100 points. And the standard deviation, remember that, the average deviation from the mean, represented here as SD, standard deviation, is 15 points. So if you took this intelligence test, and your score was between 85 points and 115 points, then you're scoring pretty much what 68% of the population does. And we know that because of the shape of the normal curve, that 68% of the area of the curve, below the curve, is between 85 points and 115 points. So think about it. You've got a mean of 100, standard deviation of 15 points. What score is one standard deviation below the mean? It would be 100 minus 15 or 85. What score is one standard deviation above the mean? That would be 100 plus 15 or 115. And so most people do score between one standard deviation below and one standard deviation above the mean. Now imagine that you scored around 70 points. That is two standard deviations below the mean, 100 minus 15 times 2. So 15 times 2 is 30. 100 minus 30 is 70. So that's a pretty low score. It's two standard deviations below the mean. Whereas if you scored up around 130 points, you're scoring two standard deviations above the mean.
So most intelligence tests today are standardized in this fashion. Standardization allows you to interpret the scores relative to how other people perform on the test. And I would definitely want you to know that the mean of modern intelligence tests is 100 points, while the standard deviation is about 15 points.